So we are good to go, I think. All right, fantastic. Uh, well, listen, thanks for having me. Um, I'm really missing being over in Ireland, one of my favorite places to visit. Uh, so um, uh, I, a lot of times I go to Dublin and then a lot of times I go down, you know, near Galway and that. So uh, I'm missing going anywhere. Uh, so I have retreated like all of us into, uh, you know, when you get done with screens all day, you know, working on screens all day, then you turn the television on and you watch screens all night. So <laughs> I do the same thing everybody else has been doing. And um, one of the shows, Mark, that I really liked, I don't know if you've seen this one, uh, but it was Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Did you get to see that? Have you seen that? Absolutely, absolutely. I think a lot of our audience would have seen, uh, would be fans of uh, anything to do with Spideyverse or anything like that. There, there we go. And the thing I liked about it was that, you know, Miles, the hero in in this in the show, uh, found out that not only was he a hero, uh, but also that there were other ways to be a hero. It wasn't just one way to be Spider Man, right? And so he had all these different characters that were Spider Man as well, and they all brought something special to what was needed. And at the end, when they battle the big guy, the the super bad guys. Uh, they all use their special talents to win the battle. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, what would be perfect is to make a PowerPoint presentation uh, and a session that goes along with that theme. Uh, so what in the world does Spider-Man and Spideyverse have to do with data and the dataverse? Well, like most of you, um, I focused on one platform for a very long time. I learned how to do something very well, and they give you money for doing that. They they will they will say, "Hey, you're really good at SQL Server. Uh, we'll make you a SQL Server DBA or developer or data analyst, and and we'll give you money." And so we tend to focus a lot of times. Uh, on one sort of platform, uh, but there's a lot more that we have available to us that we don't always think about. I mean, if we look at the Azure product stack, I mean, there's a ton of stuff here. Let's zero in on stuff we care about. Uh, this is just analytics, uh, analysis services, data explorer, data share, data bricks, uh, all, all these things here. Don't even get me started on just our area, which is just databases. And you start looking, and of course we know SQL Server, but did you know that we also support other kinds of databases like Cassandra and Postgres and, and MySQL and all these other databases? There are a lot of uh, data platforms that we need to work with. And just like Miles, uh, we can use those to win the battle, if you will. And so I thought we might take a little quick journey into this uh, dataverse. So, so let's get started. The first place we need to start, obviously, is bringing the data in, right? Uh, and we know how to bring data into a relational database management system. Uh, as we saw a moment ago, uh, we know that there are uh, you know, a lot of those. It's not just relational database management systems that are SQL or Microsoft. Uh, there are ones from uh, lesser companies uh, that we might have heard of that run these things. So uh, we have these and we're, we're pretty familiar with, with how these work. <clears throat> but there's something called no SQL. And of course, they try to get away with saying it's not SQL with it's not only SQL. But the point is, there are other ways to think about this. Now, we've given you some handy references. Let me pop over and show you one of those. We'll just close out this and pop this guys up. Uh, we actually have a complete learning path for you if you want to learn about no SQL. And the ones we have, we have open source, we have our own, and so on. So now we need to start thinking about key value pairs and document databases and columnar databases and graph databases and as you know we can even do some of these things inside SQL Server so in a relational database you can have no SQL type concepts and why are we talking about this well this is another uh, spider-man if you will this is um, maybe spidey pig uh, that shows us that we have no SQL available to us well it's not just no SQL we also have to work with large sets of data and we think about, uh, you know, sort of really big data that we need to, to talk through and work through, not just um, things like Hadoop, but also things like SQL Server big data clusters, uh, Synapse, Hyperscale, Blobs, and so on. All of these are sources for what we work with. 
Uh, and of course, then, uh, and by the way, I want to show you really quick. I'm going to pop over and show you a reference architecture that I like a lot. Um, it's from a company called Zaloni, Zaloni or Zaloni, <clears throat> and they have something called a data lake reference architecture that they that they run. And basically, we can look. We're focusing kind of here on these source systems. We'll come back uh, to this diagram in a little bit. But uh, we focus on the source system. Look at all the different places you should be getting data uh, from your systems. It's not just the data in the database. And maybe you take something out of a data warehouse somewhere and you pull that through. But there's more. There's also uh, sort of web data. And, and, and I found a really cool uh, reference for some top 20 open data sources published way back in 2016. Data.gov.uk, data.gov in the US, the Census Bureau, Socrata, European Open Data Portal, uh, New York Times Searchable Databases, UNICEF, the World Health Organizations, Google Public Data Explorer, uh, the UCI Machine Learning Repository. That has a ton of resources in it. Why would we use these? Well, there's real reasons for the analysis of data that's not in our databases. So we'll take a look at those in just a moment. But not only that, um, as we always say, the the um, the S in uh, IoT, Internet of Things, is for security. Uh, and the reason we've seen recently is things have been hacked, they've been broken. As we're bringing this data in, even at this early stage, you need to bring your spidey sense to bear and make sure that you're securing that pathway uh, as it comes through. So uh, these are just a few of the data sources. There's, there's even more. There's something called data exhaust. What in the world does that even mean? Well, uh, there's a, our folks over at Techopedia have defined data exhaust as the things that are left when you do work. Uh, cookies on your browser. There's all those cookies. We've heard about those, obviously, and other kinds of storage that is littered out log files and so on. You should be mining those kinds of data sources. So the point here that we think about is just the idea of thinking of all of the sources of data, the universe of data that we might not have been paying attention to as a data professional because we're so focused in on our database experience. Well, not only uh, bringing the data in, but a lot of times people talk about, well, how do we bring data in? Uh, not all data, by the way, is, is ingested. Uh, some of it we just, uh, you know, bring in and look at, others we just refer to, uh, and others we just sample as it goes by. So the question really becomes, when we're thinking about this, uh, do we bring it in transformed? So we think about, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, ETL versus ELT. What does that mean? Well, we're all familiar with ETL, extract. We do a transform step where we turn it into data that we can use and, and key off of and calculate the same way and so on. And then we load it in to our system. A lot of times we use a landing page and so on. Well, how about extract, load it, leave it raw, wrong, broken, and then transform it when we use it. And there's a reason to do both of those, right? Um, now for the ETL part, I think we're all familiar uh, with our good buddy uh, SQL Server Integration Services, but you may not be aware that they have SQL Server Integration Services out in Azure. You can do both. It's not an either or proposition. It's, it's more of an and proposition. You can sort of do both of these things at one time. And we've got a complete documentation of when you use each. Do you use SSIS on, prem on premises or uh, out in the cloud in, in Azure? So there's a way to do that. That's if we're going to load data, uh, but we don't always do that. A lot of times we'll set up things uh, uh, more in a pipeline. And when we think about this, uh, one tool that you might be familiar with, or not be familiar with that you need to be familiar with is the Azure Data Factory. So we think about this, let me pop over and show you one of those, uh, the Azure Data Factory here. And we think about this, I'm gonna skip down through all the architecture and show you some of the code flow. You simply build these things graphically and when you're done, you can bring in data from, well, all over. Uh, it's got connectors uh, that are built for everything. You define a pipeline that has a schedule and then it has basically actions. You have data sources and data syncs and it has actions. 
and then these actions can do things and then it has steps and you can store things and you can process things. The, the key here, the important bit to know is this idea of a pipeline. Uh, you can think of Azure Data Factory as sort of SQL Server integration services, but for sort of everything, uh, on-prem data, web data, uh, it can bring in Excel spreadsheets, the world's largest database, uh, and it can bring those things in and it can work them through. So Azure Data Factory is another technology we need to learn, uh, but that's not all. But wait, there's more, as they always say. Um, you may need to learn something called Kafka. So what I'm hoping you're doing as we're going through this quick little intro and this overview and this architecture is writing some of these things down like, wait, what? What is that? What does that do? If you come across a term you don't know, if you can't shake hands with it, then you definitely need to write that down and at least go familiarize yourself with it a little bit. There are lots of resources to do that. Um, Apache has really good documentation, so Kafka is definitely out there and you can go read through it and you think, think of things like consumers and producers and all that. But if you really want to understand it, maybe just go look at our stuff. Uh, this is from HD Insight, which is our Hadoop uh, in the cloud that Microsoft runs, and it will give you the basic concepts of things that produce data. Kafka deals with those. And then there are concepts like partitions, nodes and brokers which handle things and then uh, there are topics which are things that get subscribed to and then there are consumers of that data and you start thinking here and you can do this in azure data factory as well that as data comes in perhaps i do more than one thing with it when we think about those pipelines and when we think about these brokers and the things that kafka can do we think about the idea that perhaps we could dump the data off somewhere and we could process it in some way for some specific purpose. That's the key. What if I could do both? What if it isn't an or world or it isn't a stepwise process? What if it's a process where I can actually do these things in parallel and do them at the same time? So uh, Kafka, yet another uh, uh, technology that you need to learn. Well, we, we need to move on. Uh, we've got more to do here. Uh, once we've brought it in, or we've simply watched it go by, uh, we need to process it. And there's so many ways to process things. But really, it comes down to two questions. Do you need things done monolithically in one step, or are you okay with it being distributed? And, and what we think about here a lot is the idea of how consistent the data needs to be. So we're all familiar with the ACID, A-C-I-D properties of a relational database. And what we wanna do then to commit that data so that everything we write, we read, and we don't read until it's written, that's the consistency part, uh, we run into something called the CAP, C-A-P theorem different Marvel. Uh, Cap is a different Marvel character. We won't go into that one today. Maybe we'll do that one on another day, Mark. Uh, but this one, the Cap theorem, basically defines how quickly we can write the data down so that it can be read somewhere else. And the Cap theorem then starts breaking if things aren't very close together. But if you're willing to relax the reads a little bit, you're able to write in multiple places and eventually all those places become consistent. Uh, now we're familiar with big data, uh, and I always define big data, by the way, as any data that you can't process in the time you have with the technology you have. Uh, so if you can't get it done, like for instance, if I had a Commodore 64, um, basically a megabyte is big data. Uh, so it has nothing to do with technology. It's just the amount of data you have and the processing time you want to complete it in. Perhaps you want to complete it in your lifetime. That's always a good goal. Uh, then you're going to need some pretty big iron to do that. You won't be able to do it on a Commodore. But if you need it done in the next two minutes, you may need to distribute this thing in a new way. Now, uh, you may, we're familiar with SQL Server, and SQL Servers can do some pretty big databases. In fact, most of the data we work with fits very well within an RDBMS. But you may not be familiar with the fact that SQL Server itself has something called hyperscale. And hyperscale is a SQL Server environment. It's in Azure, but it breaks apart storage and processing. And this is another monolithic versus distributed construct where we think about the idea that you've got a layer that does the processing 
and then storage that's separate from that. We're not used to that. We install SQL Server, we get storage and the database engine all in the same place. With hyperscale, you don't, and you can go up to very, very, very large systems. And by the way, you only pay in this model when you're computing. So you pay a little bit for the storage and then you pay for the computing. That brings up an interesting topic. Uh, you'll need to know pricing. As the data professional, they're gonna ask you, well, how much does this cost? And you can't just go, oh, well, I'm the technical person. I don't care about cost. You'll need to do that. Now, there are calculators. I think Amazon has one. I know we do where you can calculate how much something will be. Well, we're not completely done here just yet. Um, we also have other kinds of systems that we can use uh, to process big data. We've got Hadoop. We've got Databricks. We've got Synapse Analytics. Um, all these things are distributed storage and processing. And uh, all of them have something very interesting in common. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the idea of Spark. So if you're not familiar with Spark, I believe I have a, a quick thing here on uh, Spark. Do I have Spark up here? Let me check real quick, or is that another thing? Uh, I talk a little bit about the modern data warehouse, and I've got all these links, and I can get these to Mark for us, where it talks about all the different use cases of these and how they're kind of architected. Yeah, here's some here's some Spark stuff. So we bring in our data sources, and we come back to that idea of the data lakes, which we're going to talk about more in just a second. Uh, we bring things in in stages, You'll notice here too that we begin to start looking at multiple audiences. So a lot of times we've written database systems for an audience where they actually, uh, the people using an app uh, look at these things. Well, we're still not done. Uh, there's still more to learn. Uh, this data lake idea has these various zones Z-O-N-E-S. So if you look up data lakes as you're making your notes for what you need to learn, you can look up the zones that you need to, to learn. Uh, oh my gosh. And then of course, you know, um, what if we didn't do that at all? Uh, what if we just stored it in memory? Uh, so we can think about memcache and, and Redis, which is another kind of in-memory cache system to where that's very inconsistent. However, it is wicked fast, as they say in the Northeast of my country. And then yet another, uh, what if we did streaming analytics? What if we just sampled the data as it goes by? So you can have a stream of data coming in through Azure event hubs and Azure streaming service. You can sample that data and hey, when the temperature gets above a certain degree, raise the or turn on the thermostat, that kind of thing. Uh, and when it goes below this value, do these things, but at the same time, store that so you could have all these things going at once. I mean, how do you pick from all this stuff? I, I mean, where do you even start? So here's an article on Memcache D. Uh, how do you even get started? Well, uh, I want you to write this down if you haven't for sure, which is the Azure Data Architecture Guide. Just write that down, uh, put that in your, uh, in your notes, Azure Data Architecture Guide and search that. Everything you need is here. It goes through every single kind of architecture uh, as you begin to look here. Here's relational data. Um, here's how you do OLAP and it's got everything you need to learn about OLAP and so on. Yet another thing for you to write down that you need to learn. Uh, what if that's not enough? Well, our, our good friend uh, Jen uh, Schultz, a friend of mine here at Microsoft, has written a choose the right deployment option. So she basically goes through and teases out uh, every single thing you need to know, and she's put this out on a GitHub. So you have a handy chart there. Well, good. Now we've brought data in. Now we've stored it, and when we've processed it, now people just keep wanting to see the data. How do they do that? Uh, well, there's so many different ways, but here's what I recommend. Think about this in a clicks paradigm. How many clicks does somebody need to do to get the data? The first thing is everyone in your company should know how to write SQL. SQL, that's right. You need to have classes during the day where you teach them how to write SQL or send them to some uh, good online training if you're not a teacher. And then you move from good queries to good single reports and good reports are just uh, essential. And then you need to move through and then get to the graphical tools. Let's, let's take a quick peek here. So I recommend they know SQL or some programming language. That's just essential. It, it's much better if they know how to do these things on their own. R and Python, if you're a SQL person, R is probably gonna be more familiar to you. 
if you're a uh, programmer, Python will feel more familiar. Either are great, both are useful. You should learn them both, but pick one to start with. R feels more data set like uh, that you work with than Python, but either can do a sort of the same thing. And then of course we get into some tools and, and there's tools you may not have thought about. Obviously Power BI and of course the world's largest database Excel, but there are others out there. I found one that I really like from Microsoft Research called Charticulator. Uh, and Charticulator is this cool web-based tool and you can see the animation here. You simply pull in your data, grab a few icons, move them around, and it makes a, uh, it makes a graphic for you, which you can embed into Power BI. Uh, you may not have even known this exists, but there's another resource in addition to Charticulator Articulator, which is really hard to say, that I found, uh, and I can share this resource with you, it's called the Visual Vocabulary from Financial Times. Uh, and it's got when to use each kind of visualization. Very, very useful, because it's not about the how pretty you make the charts, not about how pretty uh, you make these things. It's about the user being able to understand what you're trying to say, fit the visualization to the audience. And if you let them create their own, if you'll teach them a tool and where they can go get their data, if you have a data dictionary, now you don't have to keep making reports constantly, they can do it. And Power BI is very helpful for that. And uh, right inside Excel, a lot of people I know don't know how to use Excel correctly. Well, we're at the end of our time here. I've got about uh, a minute or so. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about where you can find more information. I mean, my goodness, uh, there are so many sources here. Well, if you have one URL that you need to write down today, it's this one, aka.ms forward slash and the word SQL workshops, or you can take a print screen right now. It's a good looking fella right there on the screen. You can take a print screen of that. Let me pop over and show you this resource and then we'll finish up. Uh, SQL workshops is a site that's run by myself, uh, Bob Ward and Anna Hoffman uh, here at Microsoft. We do a lot of forward facing workshops, hours and hours and hours. If you need to see everything that SQL Server has, just hit the SQL Server ground to cloud workshop. We have Azure SQL, we've got machine learning and so on. When you go into these, they are full up courses uh, with learning objectives, roles, business applications, the technologies, the audiences, and then all of the modules. You can take these alone uh, once you've done that. If you would like to teach them, we would love for you to do that. Feel free, this is on GitHub, it's available to you, uh, so feel free to grab those. Once again, uh, the URL there is just aka.ms forward slash SQL workshops. And by the way, Bob and myself and Anna, we put all of our um, uh, all of our presentation materials online as well. So anytime we presented, uh, we put these things online. Well, Mark, I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, there's so much more I wanna say, but you know what? I think you've got some speakers today who are gonna cover a lot of these technologies, don't you? Absolutely, we've got a whole ton of speakers coming up there and we're, we're going to be seeing lots of this technology. But looking at the chat in here, there seems to be one dominant question kind of coming out basically, Buck, which is one, how the hell does, does everybody get every one of your links that you just put up there? Okay. <laughs> but the and other I'll, one I'll, get, I'll send those to you, Mark, and then you can post them as after show notes. Absolutely, yes, I, I, and, and that's what will happen in there, right? But I guess the other thing then is I suppose even to kind of reiterate, where does a person even start? And I say that not even just for a newbie, but you can say that for a person who could have like 20 years experience in classical SQL Server, and then you kind of go on, I'm looking at this, where do you even start? I mean, what would be your advice there? Where do you start to learn, you know? Yeah, you know, what I usually tell people, oddly enough, is start out with Azure Data Factory or Kafka, some, some pipeline system. And the reason why is everything hangs off of that. And then take a real workload that you can think of, like, okay, I'd like my smartwatch uh, to be included with my email uh, tracking to see you know, when I've sent emails, and I'd like to see uh, how often, I'd like to visually see how often I'm in email and meetings versus when I'm walking. Come up with a question and then solve that with a pipeline. 
as you do that, you'll show the gaps in your own knowledge. You make a note, you say, okay, this I know, this I don't know. I'm gonna go learn this. You do a quick tutorial, hit up you know, YouTube or Channel 9 at Microsoft or any of these, go through a quick tutorial. And once you say, okay, I, I get it, I get it. I'm not gonna learn it, but I get it, then move on. But if you're like, that's fascinating, then dive down into that technology because you enjoy it. Yeah, perfect. So you you basically take a hobby almost is what what in here and there is almost more, almost take take a subject matter you're interested in and play. Yeah, you know and, and double I, click I, in. That's right. That's exactly right. Always learning. Every day I spend at least an hour first thing in the morning learning something I don't know, and I've done that for over forty years in this industry. And every day there's something new for me to learn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's kind of mind boggling. I know on my own side, I, I stepped away, believe it or not, from Microsoft Tech for a year or two and I went into a, some other tech. Don't know, can't even remember its name now. And when I came back, it was like, what the hell has happened? <laughs> <laughs> Feels brand new, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm flicking through the questions in here. Uh, with all the data being produced nowadays, how to tell which to store permanently? I guess, yeah, yeah. it's like, do you keep it all? Do you keep all the data? Do you keep some of the data? How do you decide what data you need? Yeah, back in the day, you know, storage was wicked expensive um, and it's not anymore. So um, the the general advice when I go out and work with a customer is keep it all. We'll figure it out later. Um, by by nature, I am not a um, someone who hoards things. I'm not a collector. Um, my wife enjoys keeping everything, you know, that she's ever touched. Uh, I don't. So we have a constant battle, which I think is healthy in a marriage. Um, but for data, I'm the opposite. If I see a gum wrapper, I'm like, save that, save that, save that. Uh, so I tend to keep it all. Now that means you need a data dictionary so you don't forget where it is. And we do have one of those inside um, Azure. You can look that up as well. The Azure, uh, we have a data dictionary service that does that for you. Yeah. Oh. And it can use any data anywhere, even on-prem under somebody's desk. Cool, that's great. And again, flicking through in there, uh, some of the comments so true. All of this tech is super fascinating. I can't wait to get into all the stuff you covered today. Best of luck there. I think there's a whole lifetime of stuff to be covered. There <laughs> is. That's the wonderful part. And you are you have some fantastic speakers that are coming up. They're going to cover a lot of these. That's why we did this session uh, as sort of everything, just to overwhelm you. And now you can go in and get just what you care about. That's super, and, and and that is great. And even to give people an idea of what's coming up next in there, just flicking through it, I'm seeing Power BI sessions, I'm seeing DBA tool sessions, I'm seeing 10 practices to make SQL Server go faster, we're seeing VMs, we're seeing more Power BI, we're seeing paginated reports, we're seeing AI, we've got data analysis. There really is a whole bunch of stuff in here, you know, there's data factory sitting in there, we've got Docker, DevOps, you know, there's 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 a whole yeah. Ton Docker of stuff. is a really important technology to learn as well. Sorry for the impromptu appearance here, but she's uh, my wife is sleeping, so she's been locked in here with me, and she's heard this presentation before, and she's not impressed. So <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to keep her quiet. That's awesome. I'm going to have one more look in here. There was a question in here, I suppose, that you hadn't mentioned Power Platform, but I think we take that as a given in there too. Power Platform is simply another Absolutely. way that you get you yep. do all yep. stuff. Four ways, and that's sort of a no-code approach to processing data, yet yet again. Um, when I teach, I teach college, and when I teach my bio uh, for the college professor is always, um, all computing is just rearranging data, and that's true, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Continuously moving data from one place to another for some reason. That's right. Even if you're playing a video game, you're taking the input from the keyboard, which is data, uh, and then you're translating that to your little person moving across the screen, and that's data. Uh, yeah. You know, the, yeah, yeah. The dots on the screen. Yep. Every, all computing is rearranging data. It's like if I remember my um, college C program and STDIO was one of your uh, standard declarations you had to do up at the top, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And input and output. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's data in, data out. That's that's awesome. Um, that's us actually done, guys, in time. And I'm just conscious of that. We just have a 10 minute break between our different slots going on there. So uh, I am going to call this. Buck, thank you so much for the informative session. Um, I think you've made people sweat a little bit about how much they have to learn in there, you know? <laughs> Um, but it was great, as ever, it was great and it's entertaining and we're delighted you took time and just to know Buck has been up at, I don't know, like half four this morning to get the session. Yep.
up. So it's, it's been an early start for him, and we greatly appreciate that in there as well. So now uh, we get to guys. now we get to start our day. Hey, Mark, you guys have a fantastic rest of the conference. I'll be watching sessions myself. Super. Thanks a million, Buck, and everybody. Thank you very much. You can go back on dataweekender.com and you'll see your normal join attract links to get on with the rest of the sessions, check the schedules, everything like that. It's been awesome. Thank you very much, Buck. Thank you. Peace.